Um, hello, my name is Sharon. I'm the editor of FinTech Futures and also Banking Technology Magazine. Uh, today's panel discussion aims to answer the question of how to build resilient financial tools and services and what policies are needed to manage the risk appropriately. These panelists, based on their experience of financial systems in their countries, will share good practices for an information sharing between different stakeholders. And part of the discussion will also be devoted to innovative fintech solutions, which often lead to the transformation within the financial sector. So I'd like to welcome all the panelists. <laughs> Hello. I guess we can just sort of jump right in, um, Arta. So I have a question for you. It's widely said that the financial sector is above average and much more mature when it comes to cybersecurity of its services, despite various attacks and data breaches this year from the likes of Amex, Capital One, DSK Bank, and even the European Central Bank. In fact, research by IBM shows how the finance and insurance sectors have been the most attacked industries for three years in a row, with 19% of total attacks and incidents in 2018. What are the reasons for the perception that the sector is secure? Arthur? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for this question. To answer to this question, we have to analyze what is the reason that banks have been the most attacked industry. And, but at the, at the beginning, we have to define what is innovation in banking. Short definition is always the best, so for our needs, we can define that the innovation is a new idea, new method, or new device. Uh, now, can we tell about two very important for banking innovation? First, of course, this is a, this is a digitalization, which start, have started in the 70s, when the first IT system were uh, installed in the bank. Since then, banks have gradually stopped managing money as a cash, uh, data has become the money, electronic data. The second very important innovation took place 25 years ago when a small bank from US, as the first in the world, offered their customers access to their money over the internet. This changed completely the banking, the way which we are banking, and of course the services which we offer to the customers and move the risk in the another area. What is the most important, it changed customer behavior and of course the needs of the customers. So we can say that the reason that we are the most often attacked are innovation. Mm -hmm. Generally we are victims of the innovation. And after after uh, implementation of this innovation, we process data as a money. We give customer access to the money from the internet Hackers don't have to attack the bank's infrastructure, which is rather good protect. It's enough when they attack the customer's workstation. And finally, it is important that successful attack gives them direct financial uh, profit. And as we know, hackers are no longer acting for the ideological reason. Answering for your question directly, there are many reasons there for the precipitation uh, banks uh, as a secure. First of all, comparing the numbers of attacks and number of the transactions which are carried out by our customers in the internet, there are really very few uh, successful attack and fraud transactions. Banks have the longest experience in the fight against attacks. Banks have the most advanced cybersecurity technology. Fraud detection system in the bank, this is the standard, and get more sophisticated every year. Apart from technology, processes and procedures are implemented to ensure security in the banks. And what is also important, bank applies security standards and they are compliance with them and regularly is audited by banking super, uh, supervision. So generally we can say that the bank are really good regulated. Uh, it all makes that the banks are secure and uh, such is their perception. But we must know that only one security incident can change it, can change perception of the customers. That's why we have to work very hard on the security, be very careful, especially with the new technology. And we have to remember that cyber world is rather dangerous. 
Well, thanks so much for that, Arta. And how about you, Michael, considering that you work in UBS? I guess, you know, I'll turn this question to you. What are the reasons for the perception that this sector is actually secure when it's being hacked all the time? So, of course, as Arta mentioned, it's, uh, it's heavily regulated. So, you know, banks, what they do, they take our money at risk. That, that's a fact. So we need to protect that money. But uh, why the banks are attacked is twofold, and it's been for since banking has been invented. So banks have money. So you know whether tra cyber threat or uh, gun to your head threat, it's always been there. But the second, and especially in the case of UBS, is that, uh, uh, and it was mentioned uh, in the previous panel, it's that it's the client data and the clients. UBS is the biggest wealth manager, so it's not only the money that we have as the bank but it's also the data of our clients. And we need to be ready, not only for ourselves as the bank, to uh, wave off these threats, but also be ready to advise our clients and protect our clients. That's even more important to, to UBS. Mm. And, uh, and we believe that, uh, uh, as also was mentioned, that banking is people business. You know, so every threat starts and ends with people. So we really want to, and why we are in Poland, to hire the best people to help us with divine, uh, div de designing the new architecture and building the new approach to risk. Because there is a new approach that the hackers or cyber uh, criminals operate. And uh, we want to have the best people to help us with that, and that's, that's our approach to that. So it's technology, but first and foremost is the people. Thanks for that. And Rahav, how can other sectors follow the example of financial industries if it's perceived as being ahead of other industries? So first of all, collaborate more. In Israel, it is allowed for all of the financial institutions to collaborate around cybersecurity. It is not allowed to collaborate around anything else. Uh, but cybersecurity, it is clear that it is mandatory to share information in order to help the entire sector to be more secure. Uh, on top of that, uh, another thing that we have uh, is uh, sectorial certs. We have a financial cert that is part of Israel's national cert, and at the same manner or in the same manner, we have additional sectorial certs. Each one of them is focused on specific systems and tools, specific attack methods and vectors uh, that are changing from one business to another. So this is another thing of uh, the, having the ability to see the entire sector uh, or all of the sectors all together is something that is uh, very important in order to have that a broader perspective and broader understanding. Okay, I guess since you mentioned CERT, <laughs> I thought it would be good uh, a time as any really to dive into that. So can you tell us a little bit about CERT and yeah. its initiatives? So um, one of the interesting things of, or one of the interesting unique um, entities that we have in Israel is a financial CERT. And the financial CERT is a sectorial CERT that is co-owned by the Ministry of Finance and by the Cyber Directorate that is in charge of cyber for uh, the civil uh, area in Israel. And the financial CERT is serving and providing services to the entire financial ecosystem in Israel. 100% uh, of the banks are connected to it, 100% of the credit card companies, all of the big insurance companies, most of the medium ones, uh, the stock exchange and so on, and all of them are connected on a voluntary basis. It is up to them to decide whether they would like to connect. In order to be able to consume services such as information sharing with information that is coming from many, many sources that we have, national, international, commercial, uh, security agencies, wise and so on, in order to have the support with incident handling and uh, with boots, IR teams that can help with boots on the ground, with um, help with interfaces, external interfaces and so on, and also with cybersecurity drills that we are running to the financial ecosystem and the financial leadership that allows the financial leadership to be able to take financial decisions, not cyber-related decisions, but they are based on cybersecurity scenarios that demand them uh, to um, um, take very tough decisions that they need, didn't need to take previously. And the interesting thing about cyber is that it is usually a black box. No one really understands what exactly happened if there is a, a thinking that you were attacked or tar you are being a target. So uh, this allows them to 
um, have that experience. Well, thanks for that. And Sebastian, since we're talking about you know, policies and measures, what policies are needed in order to appropriately manage the cyber risk related to financial services? Well, that's always a difficult question, but um, <clears throat> I think you, you need to have a, well, a proper mix, uh, I would say, uh, and to make sure that this mix is, is right. Um, when we discuss with uh, well, regulatory authorities at European level, I think we, we, we tend to tell them, well, let's, let's also start with, with basics. Um, first of all, you need to define uh, what is exactly, uh, what are the cyber incidents you speak about. So, a kind of taxonomy, uh, because we all speak a different language, and sometimes it's difficult to understand each other. And in order to also assess the cyber threat, I think you need to understand what you speak about. That's the first thing. Um, secondly, um, especially uh, myself being at, at European level, we, we call for some convergence. On the, on the requirements, um, because of course those banks who, uh, I would say, operate at international level, they have to face very, very diverging uh, requirements, or very diverging framework, which make it much more complicated for them also to, um, to comply, and which also uh, could create a hurdle uh, that could be actually uh, used by uh, cyber uh, attackers. Um, then, uh, I think it was mentioned by you as well, and I, we very, mu very much concur to that. I think you, you need to make sure that you have a regulatory framework which allows for uh, proper information sharing. Uh, information sharing and cooperation in cyber security is, is essential. Um, so you need to make sure that um, actors, both within a sector, um, can share um, well relevant information. It could be a um, cyber incident, but also, I mean, um, uh, well, information about cyber threats um, and measures that they have taken uh, in to to, um, to to solve the um, the incident. And it's only it's not only info sharing amongst uh, I mean the private sector itself. It's also info sharing. Um, to the authorities, to the public authorities, and from the public authorities to the um, um, uh, private sector. Ju just to give you um, uh, one, one example to illustrate that um, uh, we, we have a memorandum of understanding with Europol uh, as, as European Banking Federation. So we cooperate quite closely with them, of course not specifically ourselves, but we are the gateway to our members' banks. And, and, and thanks to this cooperation, we have uh, actually succeeded in some uh, quite um, well successful operation to, to arrest uh, cyber attackers. So Europol, uh, with the information they had, uh, speaking with the different police in Europe, um, actually gathered, gathered at the time a number of banks in a room and from them, they, they built an operation to arrest uh, some, some attackers. So those are very efficient ways, actually, to also um, stop um, um, criminals. Then I would add perhaps one or two uh, additional elements. Um, I think you need to stress test or to make exercise also, uh, to make sure that you're uh, resilient. Uh, so this also, I mean, is progressively uh, introduced in, 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 well, at national level, at European level. I think it's very important also preventively to test your, your, your security. So there as well, you need a regulatory framework most of the time to do that. And last but not least, I think one of the particularity of the banking sector, I'm sorry for being a bit long, um, is as, as, as it was mentioned, um, we complain a lot about that, um, but the fact that we are heavily regulated and supervised actually help us in this matter as well. Uh, because, well, it's good to have rules, it's good to have, um, I mean, um, uh, measures in place, but the fact that you are supervised on an ongoing basis about those measures kind of force you, of course, to be uh, up to scale. Well, thanks very much for that, Sebastian. And I want to turn to Arta, actually. Um, how can fintech solutions influence cybersecurity in the financial sector, and how does it change the approach to risk management? Mm -hmm. 
policies and regulations are very important, of course, to manage cyber risk in the financial special uh, institution. But also it's very important that the banking supervision uh, is active in this area. But uh, at the same time, do not block the possibility of doing uh, business. In the case of Polish financial supervision authority, in my opinion, this condition is met. Polish banking supervision is very, really very active uh, in the security area. An ex interesting example of the positive activity was implementation in 2013 Recommendation D. Recommendation D is the collection of over 120 details IT recommendation divided into several uh, areas like the IT infrastructure management, access control, and user computing. Uh, IT security management and other. Uh, it covers all areas of IT activities at the bank, as a matter of fact. Uh, recommendation there was uh, prepared banking supervision, but its implementation was preceded, preceded by consultation uh, with the banks. The recommendation had to be implemented by banks uh, by the end 2014, so we had almost two years for it. After publication of the recommendation, the banks had to conduct GAP analysis. Uh, realization of recommendation was uh, regularly reported to the level of management board and supervisory board. After its implementation was performed another uh, GAP analysis. And finally, of course, the internet audit, internal audit had to control the quality of implementation of recommendation and prepare a report. Uh, which had to be approved by the management board and sent to banking supervision. And of course, at the end, uh, Polish banking supervision uh, conduct a very detailed audit, uh, confirmed that we achieve compliance with the recommendation. It was a huge project, uh, almost two years, uh, and a very large budget, with a very large budget involving all banks' areas. And from my perspective, as a person who was the leader of this project and is responsible for IT risk and IT governments, the project pulled it order IT risk management in whole organization. And what is the most important, it also had educational value uh, for all employees in the banks, uh, from the ordinary employees in the branches and the head office, through managers and the uh, members of the management board. In my opinion, that was a good impl implementation and good example of uh, implementation, very uh, uh, necessary uh, policies in the organization. Well, thanks for that. And Rahav, I was wondering, you know, with what um, Arta has said, um, what do you think are the fintech solutions that can influence cybersecurity? And how does it change the approach to risk management for you? So there are several areas that are changing. Mm -hmm. First of all, I believe that fintech products, uh, validation, um, um, security methods that the customer is using must be much more complex on one hand, but simpler for the end user to use in order to be able to make sure that uh, the person that is running the operation is the right person. Second, I even do not doubt that in the future there will be some sort of uh, cybersecurity standard that is relevant specifically even for the fintech products because of the level of influence that they have on the banking and the uh, financial institutions uh, industries. Um, on top of that, security by design is something that is mandatory. Um, another project that we're running is a fintech cyber innovation lab in which we're leveraging uh, the government's cyber financial data to fintech and cyber startups, to the private sector in order to, uh, to help and promote them on one hand. And on the other hand, to make sure that the fintech products that we receive at the end of the day are secured. So the collaboration and the connection between the two is mandatory. Now with regards to risk management, the focus that we have at the financial cert and in general in, in financial cyber is not on a specific product, tool, even not a specific institution. We are focusing on end-to-end -end financial processes. So we want to make sure that the entire financial process 
is delivering what it is intended to deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are even focusing in guidance to the financial supply chain in order to make sure that our third party suppliers do not harm that process as well. Thanks for that. And Seb, in the era of technology such as AI, cloud computing, blockchain, um, do you think it's possible for regulatory requirements to keep pace with this rapid wave of technological change? Well, the answer is no, of course. Uh, <laughs> almost impossible. Um, I mean, regulation will always lag behind uh, technological uh, developments. Um, no, still, uh, a good regulation should be designed in a way that it's technology neutral, which is not so easy, especially with a very disruptive technology such as, of course, uh, blockchain, because the, the concepts are there very, very different. Um, but um, I think concept, as the one mentioned uh, by my colleague of security by design, uh, should actually apply also, well, not only for products and services, but mostly also for regulation. I mean, when you um, design a regulation, I think you should also take into account this idea of uh, uh, cyber security when drafting when drafting it. Um, that's certainly something we we push for, and that there is a kind of assessment of any proposal and the impact on on, on cyber. Um, and then, uh, well, a good regulation could also be a bit more principle-based, um, risk-based, so try to have a good understanding of the risk. And so not too prescriptive, not too detailed, in order to be able indeed to, um, well, uh, keep uh, uh, being, being still, well, properly applied with new uh, technology. Uh, uh, development. Perhaps last but not thing, I think what is very important as well is that, and that's not only for, for this specific point, but uh, to make sure that research academics uh, are also uh, cooperating or uh, feeding uh, any debate, including on the, uh, the way regulation are, are, are designed. Um, and of course, academics could have sometimes a, uh, well, a good analysis of what I mean those new technology could bring uh, as new as new risk. Well, thanks for that, Sebastian. Michael, I can see that you are passionately and enthusiastically nodding away at some of the points that Sebastian raised. I guess working in UBS, I guess it's no surprise that you thought that regulation is lagging behind. So please do share your thoughts. Yes, obviously. And then we, we operate globally. So as Sebastian mentioned, it's uh, really a pile of regulation that we are under and we need to adhere to all of them. Uh, and that's the problem, I believe. It's that... Uh, regulators also should collaborate, so it's not only banks that should collaborate, but regulators, they need to come up with common standards for the financial institutions to be much easier to cope with that, because we want to be secure, but we want to be secure at a fair price. And because regulation, every regulation comes with a cost uh, to the financial institutions. Uh, and that, that's to me, it's really important, so, so that the regulators talk to each other, and they work on a common standard. Because right now, when you look at FED, if you look at the Buffin, or if you look at the uh, Euro regulations, or MIS in Singapore, there's a totally different approaches to risk, and totally different approaches to banks, how they should deal with that risk. So of course, technology helps banks, but uh, banks do not only look at the cyber threat as I mentioned, to, to themselves as the organization or the clients, but banks also support and play a very vital role in uh, combating financial crime like f terrorist financing, bribery, corruption, and so on and so forth. So that's where the blockchain, artificial intelligence, and really big data analysis helps also banks in know your client activities, cl client onboarding. So that helps us to support and protect the whole system. So not only ourselves, but banks play a role in the whole system. And I would like to see that regulators also acknowledge that. So don't see the banks that the, those poor guys that they need to adhere to the regulation, but they also recognize the role they play for the whole system, for the whole economy. Thank you for that. And oh, I guess Rahaf, you want to chime in? Can, can I add one <laughs> yes, short sentence? Regulators will always be slower than technology, yes but 
they are doing that in order to protect all of us because of the fact that when technology will, um, you know, a startup will take a risk and then technology will not deliver what it is intended to deliver, then one startup or several startups will fall. Mm -hmm. When a regulator is uh, taking a decision that is too fast a about a specific technology, about a specific limitation that will be reduced, the implication of the entire ecosystem can be something that is very dramatic. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for that. And Sebastian, you wanted to sort of revert as well. No, well, yeah, I wanted to to say to say um, two things. I think I fully right with you. Of course, the the the, the idea is not specifically to regulate. I mean, uh, the idea is to uh, make business, to uh, develop uh, new ideas, to use technologies, and when necessary, you have to 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 regulate to to protect. Uh, perhaps, um, uh, I mean, the large public. Or, um, so that, that's, that's fully right. One thing I wanted to react on is indeed uh, what my colleague from UBS says. is um, I think very important, and it actually it works better on cybersecurity than other, other issue, is to consider, uh, I mean, the private sector as a partner. And on cybersecurity, I think it works quite well, actually, that the, uh, there is trust still between I think the uh, the banking sector and the authorities in order to to, to tackle yeah. cyber attacks, uh, and and of course then my reaction was uh, on other type of um, mission that have been actually uh, provided to the banking sector, like the fight against risk financing, like the fight against money laundering. We would love also to see a bit more trust and cooperation because there sometimes we have the perception that the, the, the financial industry or the banking sector is considered as an enemy and not as an ally. Well, it looks like quite the touchy okay. subject. Arta, yeah. please also okay. chime in. <laughs> We're all giving our two cents. <laughs> I think that new technology will be always uh, ahead uh, of law and regulation. Technology like cloud computing, uh, machine learning, and uh, robotics, uh, blockchain. But it doesn't mean that we could not uh, implement it. Of course, we have to do it very carefully and take care about the risk connected with this new technology, but this is not forbidden. A good example for me, this is the cloud computing, because there is the future, and we know that all the industry will use it, especially sector, financial sector is very interesting in this uh, technology. And uh, how I told, this is not forbidden, but we have to take care what we do and how we do. Especially concerning the cloud computing, we have to make the, some risk analysis connected with this kind of the data processing. We have to make the SWOT analysis and to be sure that it's good for our business to go to help and make the the, the, the enter to the, the, the cloud computing. We have to have uh, prepared the procedure to terminate cooperation with company which gives us uh, the cloud computing. And most important, we have to be sure that in this cloud that our data, especially that is the bank secrecy, data privacy, are very secure. And from the European point of view, it is very important that this data will be processed just in the European Union. Well, thanks so much for that. Um, and since we are talking about European regulations, I thought I'd turn my attention to the NIS directive. So, Sebastian, how would you assess the role of the NIS directive in ensuring the appropriate level of financial services security? And what have we learned in the recent months in the context of implementing this European law? Well, I, I think the NIS um, directive in Europe is, is to be considered as a, as a regulatory milestone. Um, so, it, of course, uh, has positive uh, impact. Um, by the way, it's currently being assessed. Uh, I think that there were already some uh, announcement by the, Euro the new European Commission that uh, the N NIS directive would be would be uh, reviewed. Um, and while financial services are most of the time in most of the country considered indeed as uh, essential services, so particularly uh, uh, targeted also by the NIS directive. But on the other hand, as, uh, as far as the financial services are concerned, we also consider that when we go already much further than most of the requirements of the N NIS directive, um, we, as I mentioned, we are heavily regulated, we are uh, heavily supervised, 
Um, so the, the NS directive is a bit more more of a minimal requirement, um, which we, we, we also support because I also believe that one of the main issues for the, for, the, for the financial sector is to make sure that, I mean, the other um, uh, players with whom we interact are also uh, leveling up their um, well, cyber security protection because, I mean, the financial sector is more and more interacting with fintech, with startup, with third parties. And that's good for many reasons, for um, I mean, financial innovation, for competition, but it's also opened a lot of new risk uh, because the more you interact with actors, sometimes very small actors, the more you, well, to a certain ex extent, open your system to, um, to new risk. So the importance to make sure that, I mean, the entire ecosystem, not only the banking sector, or banks as such, are uh, upscaling their uh, cyber security um, uh, measures is, is very important for us. Um, now, if you if you look at the assessment from well, it's, it's currently being being uh, undertaken, but one of the the critics which was mentioned within uh, Europe is the critic that I mean again my colleagues uh, from UBS um, highlighted at global level so even at European level the way the NIS directive has been implemented in the different countries is sometimes uh, diverging, which of course uh, doesn't doesn't uh, help. And 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 last issue, last comment on that: there are requirements in the I NIS directive which are overlapping or duplicating sometimes with similar requirements imposed to banks in other types of regulation. Just to give you one example, I mean, on cyber incident or cyber incident type of I mean, reporting that banks have to comply with, I think they, they should do that uh, on, based on the NIS directive, they should do that based on some specific directive on payments, on data protection, they have to do that to, I mean, banking supervisors. So actually, they multiply, they multiplying, they are multiplying the the, the reporting uh, requirements, and well, having perhaps one authority or at least more convergence in this area would would help, in my opinion. And how about you, Michael? I can see you sort of nodding as as well. It's <laughs> yeah, so probably never-ending story oh, with the banks versus regulators or yeah. teaming up with the regulators. Yeah, it's not a versus. I'm just joking, Sebastian. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that that that's that's the point. Yeah. So so this this uh, amount of the regulation and the requirements that the banks are facing, especially those that operate on a, on a global scale, it's it's really overwhelming, and the. And in fact, it's a risk in itself. So as Sebastian mentioned, it's we create a lot of um, touch points. And the, the more touch points we have, the more prone to the error we are. And that, that's the problem. So not even the sophisticated crime, but even you know, such an erroneous en environment with multiple uh, uh, reporting uh, lines, that, that's what we need to deal with and really up the game, bring the game to the next level to simplify the rules and really understand the basic risks. Because that that's, uh, uh, and throughout the whole day we learned that we don't even understand well the risks that are related to the cyber world. And it's just one fraction of, of the overall risks that are lingering there for the financial institutions. So we really need to start baselining the, the subject and understand the underlying risk. And then let, in my opinion, banks do their work and then verify it because the regulators, on one hand, they should put the rules in place, but then, of course, check on that rules, how they are implemented by the various actors on the market because then that's really important because, uh, as mentioned, uh, you have various regulations and then you have various expectations how these rules are getting implemented and you have only one organization. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem for big organizations, not to, again, multiply the problem and create uh, multiple departments to deal with the same problem. That's what we are seeing right now. Yeah, sure. Of course, Sebastian. I don't want to, to monopolize too much the floor, but just to illustrate that as well, I mean, uh, cloud computing is a, is a good example uh, where, I mean, progress are made. But if you, if you look at the way banks actually um, 
um, uh, had to, um, I mean, contract even for, I mean, outsourcing part of their activities or part of their data to uh, cloud service providers. So big banks in Europe, which are subsidiaries in, I don't know, five, six, seven countries, well, they had to, to, to reassess, reassess in each and every country whether the same cloud service provider, by the way, sometimes uh, is indeed fit for, uh, I mean, security purposes, uh, understand the um, understanding the risk, uh, has process in place, um, has the data indeed at European level, open uh, it for uh, audit trail. Um, uh, well, our call was there to make sure that there is one, uh, one, one stop shop or one entry point to make sure that actually you have to, to make these assess ass assessments only once and not in each and every uh, country. That would ease, I think, such a process dramatically. Um, and then linked to that, uh, and there are also progress, I think, in this respect, uh, there is this idea of certification uh, based on standardization. That if you certify, well, could be uh, IoT as we discussed, uh, with, uh, device, but it could could also be, uh, I mean, cloud service uh, um, providers, for instance, that they are certified, certified on, on an ongoing basis, um, and that would again reassure very much, I think, not only banks but their supervisors that they can uh, use those service, those cloud service provider more more easily and not start again and again assessing their, 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 their um, well, whether they are, they are fit for, for the purpose of... Uh, so that's, that's an interesting development as well, and this idea of certification at European level. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thanks so much for that. I guess one final question for the panel before we turn our attention to the audience. Um, what steps should be taken by banks in order to remain competitive with disruptive fintech solutions which are not constrained by the existing regulatory frameworks and can often um, offer more attractive services for customers? So I'll turn this to, um, of course, Rahav. I guess you're holding the mic and you're ready to go. <laughs> so let's turn it to you first. So banks should, first of all, continue or invest more in information sharing and collaboration and, uh, around cybersecurity. I couldn't emphasize more how much it is important and it will help them become uh, better and more competitive eventually because they will be more secure, period. Second, invest in innovation. And more than that, do not invest only in speci exposing specific sets of data or exposing specific actions, but more than that, expose the entire branch operation to the customer. Make the customer the clerk of, of himself in order to be able uh, to deliver more to him faster and to invest the money that is needed in order to operate the branch in other areas. And how about you, Arta? We haven't heard from you in some time, and I guess I wanted to turn my attention to you. So what steps should be taken by banks in order to remain competitive, especially against fintechs? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, we know that there are risks connected associated with innovation. But we as a bank, as a matter of fact, we have no choice. We have to be innovated. That is, you know, that is for sure. Uh, and. When we are innovated, we have to take care about our customers because the innovation uh, is connected with the high level of the risk. But to ensure customer security, we must follow standards and uh, procedures. Uh, how I told that the recommendation day which we implemented five years ago, that was first step to make that the security of the customers in the all area in the bank will be on the appropriate level. And of course, we have to have a technology that ensure the high level of security for the customers, especially internet banking. And of course, we have to cooperate, not just with the, another banks, not the institution. We have to cooperate with the police. We have to cooperate with prosecutors. And uh, this is the rule which must be. Uh, the banks are in the specific situation because we offer our customers direct uh, application which give them possibility to uh, have the access to their money. So 
for banks, this is very important that we offer the very comfortable uh, application uh, for the customers, but a part of that, it sh should be very secure. Well, thanks for that. And how about you, Michael, you know, because you work in UBS, so how do you stay competitive with the likes of, you know, your Monzos, your Starlings, your Revoluts, especially when it comes to, you know, like, basically offering better solutions as well, so... Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, P probably we'll never be able to compete with travel directly. <laughs> That's why we are wealth manager, <laughs> per se, oh. of course. But uh, joking aside, so uh, we at UBS believe that banking is people business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so we heavily invest in the people. And as Sebastian mentioned, we, we also very tightly control our vendor footprint and the third party risk management. And technology is becoming, as Artur said, um, uh, a competitive advantage also for the financial institutions. So having really a very strong technology department and uh, and retaining the knowledge within the organization, it's a key to the success. So we have insourced a lot of the, of the work that previously was done by the vendors for the bank and we are right now intensively increasing our internal footprint in the technology department for the bank. So you may argue that one fourth of the total bank's workforce is technology department for UBS. And that's, we believe that we can then compete uh, with, uh, with the fintechs, yeah? because that's, or create an ecosystem, because we don't want to compete with, with Revolut. We, we want to be part of the ecosystem where every, every player has its, uh, has, uh, brings its value to the table and everybody benefits. Uh, and most importantly, the client benefits from that. So that's how I take on it. Thanks for that. And Sebastian, I guess, because, you know, the EBF has all these initiatives for fintech, so just tell us a bit about that. Well, many things have already been said, uh, and I will not, uh, although I, I very much would like to come on a specific case of Revolut, but, you know, if you compare UBS and Revolut, I mean, UBS exists for hundreds of years, Revolut for some years only. Um, so you will have to assess that at a time as well, of course. They are very innovator, and that's that's of course very important. And banks need to um, to 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 uh, innovate as well. No, I think banks are innovating a lot uh, as well, and have always been uh, uh, very important innovator on the market. Uh, um, no, um, and by the way, well, some of those fintechs are not even yet. Uh, I mean, making any profit. So, so th those are interesting uh, analyses that you you need to to, to make as well. Um, so, if you if you if you assess a bit more in depth the uh, the fintech market, uh, most of those fintechs are actually also uh, well open to to be acquired or, or for cooperation with banks. It's the only way for them to survive. Uh, no, I stop here on the uh, competition uh, with fintechs because also I believe actually that. Most of the models should be a cooperative, cooperative models, and that's also what's what's happening. I think banks should indeed be open to a cooperation with uh, innovators, whether it's, with whether whether it's internally or with um, external suppliers. Um, very very important because I think they bring uh, benefit both ways. Um, that's one. The second issue, uh, so innovating, for sure, that's clear, but they invest, I can tell you, hundreds of millions a year, uh, banks to innovate. Uh, of course, they have legacy, they have, uh, etc., which make it sometimes a bit more complicated to, uh, to be as high as a start startup firm. Well, second, um, I, I fully concur with what you said on the um, uh, security uh, or protection of data assets. I think it's one of actually uh, the main uh, assets indeed for banks. Um, and at the end, it can also uh, be um, a, a really um, well important uh, diverging point or, or successful point uh, for banks. If you compare, uh, if you make some surveys about uh, I mean, where as citizen we would like to put our money or data, I can tell you that many of us will tell, I prefer to put that in a bank than in a, in a big tech, for instance. Why? Because indeed banks are used uh, to protect as much as possible uh, their uh, uh, assets, the assets or their data of their of their customers. So, so that's certainly 
um, a dif a differing point which uh, is a big uh, asset for, for banks again. Um, perhaps I should say uh, last but not least because of course as, as EBF we interact a lot indeed with regulators and um, uh, at European level. Um, I think it's important for banks also to make sure that there is a kind of level playing field. Um, and, and not only a, a, a level playing field, but the, that the, uh, back to, to one of your first question, I mean, the regulatory framework as it exists is not always fit for the uh, digital purposes. So if banks want to deploy further the digital strategy, they are still facing a lot of regulatory obstacles, which make it much more, com uh, much more complicated. Just to give you one example, which was, I think, very illustrative, is, which is almost solved now, I mean, for banks, it was almost impossible to uh, um, uh, onboard clients digitally a few, a few years and in some countries a few months ago. So it was still almost uh, compulsory to, um, well, to have a face-to-face -face, uh, um, contact with, with new, uh, new clients. So, and that was imposed by regulation or by supervisors. So how could you uh, innovate if already the uh, onboarding uh, is, 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 uh, is not even digital? So do, those are kind of examples. But so, yeah, innovation invests as much as possible in uh, protecting uh, against cyber attacks or data, data breach. And la la last but not least, uh, we'll call for um, uh, a regulatory framework which is fit for, for digital purposes. Thank you so much, guys. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any sort of audience questions, but do feel free to send your questions on Twitter and continue the discussion there. I'm sure these guys will be happy to help. And once again, thank you so much for everyone um, sort of staying tuned. And thank you again to the panelists as well.